We were always excited about the power of content. It was how we got our message out into the world. We felt that if we generously gave what we were learning and thinking, good things would come back. We started with our blog. We wrote books, held events. Then we got older and quieter, as companies tend to do. This is our effort at a comeback to the original intercom content energy, and this is our latest iteration for 2024. We're calling it Off Script. It's a series of recordings that will be open conversational presentations that we hope you'll find both useful and interesting. I don't want to spoil the whole series, but we will be talking a lot about the future of customer service and the impact that AI is destined to have on it. In this very first episode of All Script, Des will talk about the generative AI revolution that startups and all of technology, and very, very soon, all of society at large will certainly be going through. He'll tell the story of our reaction to this moment, how we launched our first generative AI features within just two months of OpenAI's first ChatGPT release, and then launched Finn, our AI customer service agent, just a few weeks after that. But most usefully to you, he'll talk about how to make the most of this opportunity. He'll give you frameworks and ideas for thinking through the ways in which you need to reinvent yourselves in this post-AI world. This is classic Des Trainer energy, and I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Do you know who Alexander the Great's tutor was for about 14 years? Aristotle. Through the miracle of the printed page, I can at least read what Aristotle wrote without an intermediary. But I can't ask Aristotle a question. My hope is that in our lifetimes, we can make a tool of a new kind, of an interactive kind, getting more refined year after year after year. And in our lifetimes, it should get very refined. And so my hope is someday we can capture the underlying worldview of Aristotle. And someday some student will be able to not only read the words Aristotle wrote, but ask Aristotle a question and get an answer. I found that clip on Twitter, and the thing that really stuck with me was, like, generally speaking, this is a guy who sees the future. And uh, and he made that kind of, like, crazy distant proclamation that, honestly, I'd never heard before. But when I look at it now, I realize, like, he really did properly see the future. And granted, it wasn't, unfortunately, in his lifetime. But we're very, really able to ask Aristotle questions now. and. Uh, and that's just a reminder of the sort of leaps that we've seen over the past couple of years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along. Any single second of the Steve Jobs introduction of the iPhone is just devastatingly amazing from like time he opens the map and you see all the like pins drop for the coffee shop to when he just transitions into a phone call. You know, it's, it was just an end to end. You're looking at the future. Forget what you know about technology. And um, I think, you know, to anyone who works in tech, those moments are, they're rare. I probably have had like, for myself, I, I think the first time I played with a Commodore Amiga, Web 2, iPhone, and then honestly, I, I AI, but I, I really, a lot of us in Intercom think this, AI is bigger than all of them, possibly all of them put together. AI is like, it's beyond comprehension a lot of time. The jobs that people do or want to get done are often quite timeless. To give you an example, like. Uh, if I want to send you a package, I'll probably use FedEx or DHL. Julius Caesar would have used horseback. But the job is still the same. Get this thing from here to there. The photo shows on one side is a commuter vehicle in like in the early 1900s, maybe. Um, there's a lot of people reading newspapers. And they're doing that because they're bored on a long commute. Today's version of that is a, if you get on a train or a bus uh, and look around try to see any single person's face you won't what you'll see is the top of their head because their face is angled down and they're face deep in a phone the job of being bored on public transport and trying to entertain yourself hasn't actually changed it's just the technology has changed and the reason i make that point a lot is because sometimes people uh, they can be 
technologists who love today's technology and they fall in love with like their favorite piece of technology. And this could be like a framework or a piece of hardware or something like that. But you can't fall in love with the solution to a problem. You have to fall in love with the problem to be able to like survive these technological leaps, these like super cycles like AI. You have to be in love with the problem you're trying to solve uh, because the technology will come and go, right? Uh, you know, there'll be a better way always to do these things and it'll come along every 10, 20, 30 years. There'll be a whole new way to do it. And you, you don't want to be one of those people clinging onto your fax machine. So in the case of AI, uh, what I would say is understand at, at its core what is the job your product actually does for people. It could be that you just connect people with other people. It could be that you account for every employee. It could be that you help people talk to each other. But you have to just understand that job at its actual core, independent of any technological solution. And then with that core understanding, ask yourself, how can AI make this quicker, easier, better, faster, or more accessible to more people in more situations? I make that point a lot to try and encourage people to, in order to like build in the new world, you have to only bring forward the problem you're trying to solve and don't bring any of the baggage that the, your previous solutions might have carried. If you compare AI with the best of what humans can do, uh, the humans will usually be better in a lot of cases. Slower, more expensive, uh, but better. Um, so AI is probably not going to get you a design as good as a great designer. The first thing you have to realize is most humans aren't great designers. So you have to understand it's the average that we're comparing with, not always the best. And that's the first point where people will get tripped up in thinking how this will affect their business, is that like the average person can't do design. So if you, if you build a piece of AI that can help them do design, that's a massive step forward. And the ability of a world-class designer is actually not relevant in that, in that formula, right? The second thing I think you have to just think about is just the economics of all this. There are a lot of products where like, you know, fast beats amazing. So even we even see versions of this in customer support. Like if I ask a question like, hey, how do I reset my password? I actually don't want the artisanal handcrafted answer, which is like, good evening, Mr. Trainer. Uh, thank you so much for your detailed query regarding password reset. I will sacrifice a little bit of quality for a zero second response. The 30th of November, 2022, I first saw uh, something on Twitter, then I saw a few pings in a Slack channel. Um, and it was one of those, you know, I think we'd all been through a bit of like, you know, a bit of crypto hype, a bit of Web3 hype. So you're kind of like, oh, I'm sure this is a thing, but whatever, I'll get back to it. Then like my phone kept going and I got like a message from our head of AI at the time, Fergal, uh, just with a link saying, have you seen this? And I was like, yeah, I've been, you know, everyone seems to be talking about it, I wonder what it is. And then I think I got a text from Kieran, uh, Intercom's uh, co-founder co and original CTO. Uh, he was like, I've been playing with this thing, it's pretty cool. And then I looked at Slack again, and it was a long message from Fergal, which was like, this is a huge leap in capabilities. And then Fergal posted a tweet as well at the same time, saying like, sound the alarm bells, uh, this is a huge step forward. I think the thing that was most immediately obvious with, say, ChatGPT when it launched was, it was really good at conversation and really good at like sort of basic problem solving. And a lot of our world in customer service is conversations about basically solving basic problems. And, uh, and this thing could do it pretty, pretty well. And for sure, it didn't, it lacked all the nuance of like a per specific instance, like it didn't understand our refund policy or whatever, but very obviously, like if you ask, ask yourself, like what are large language models good at? Well, conversation, basic reasoning, uh, like fact finding, prob basic problem solving. And then on top of that, they work 24 seven and they can speak lots of different languages. Uh, you know, uh, it means it was obviously gonna have some impact on support. And I think that impact was gonna be like somewhere on the scale of like medium to large. We have always wanted to be at the forefront of like, having the best technology available for customer service. This was clearly new technology there was going to be a race to adopt it to change the game of customer service. We talked about it at length, uh, me and Fergal, me and Owen, like uh, Paul, our head of product, et cetera. Like, there was like lots of discussion there. I don't think any of us could see a world where this wasn't going to be one of the biggest changes in the customer service landscape ever. So I think on Monday, we were like, let's go. So 
Fergal's team cancelled their plans and they got busy building what was their first release. It was called the Inbox AI. It was a series of augmentations and improvements to the Inbox. We released that really, really damn quickly. Like, I think it was like seven weeks end to end, possibly faster. I don't want to do them a disservice. But uh, it really just felt like a, a proud moment for the company to have like caught a wave and caught it so well and moved so quickly. A lot of which hinges on like Fergal's attention, Owns decision making, just it, like, when people talk about startups moving fast, it's actually executive decision making is the first thing that I look, that, you know, that you should look to, and that was what we had that I think a lot of folks wouldn't naturally have. So we we hit we hit like that release and it was really popular, and then we immediately got to work. Now this is before GPT four had even been released, but we were already working behind the scenes, Fergal's team, on uh, on well, could this thing actually do proper customer support? And I think that that work had started in January. It was already blowing our minds by like February. Um, I had like seen uh, like examples of it. Like Fergal had done a little workshop with us in the design studio. And uh, and by July when it went live to everyone, it was blowing everyone's minds. And now today it's done, gosh, like 5 million answers or something like this. It's a total resolution of 40% for people. And it's only going up like that's, you know, as a, as a product, it's been incredible to witness and it's like, uh, it's a great example to me of like what AI can do if you move quick enough on it. Generally speaking, like when something like this happens, it's like an extinction moment. It's it's like a meteorite hits the sort of your, your industry, and some will survive, but not all. And the framing that is often used when people talk about survival is the species not the strongest, not the biggest, not the one with the largest bank balance, but simply the one who's quickest to adapt and react. I think that's the first thing it means for companies understand that AI is happening. There's a good chance whole chunks of your product, your business, your offering uh, have to change. Some pieces just won't be relevant anymore at all. And because of that, you need to start thinking about for your entire tech stack, for your entire product, every workflow, every task, you have to start asking yourself, does AI change how this would get done? So. If you are a word processor or an issue tracker or a project management tool, uh, you start asking yourself things like, well, at this point, the user would normally write a summary of the project to date. Do they? When AI could do that in like 0 0.02 seconds or whatever? Probably not. That whole feature, no longer necessary. Or at this point, the user would, would identify if this receipt is valid. Really? Because AI is pretty good at like, you know, this idea of like, uh, it's, it's very multimodal. It can scan images, it can scan PDFs, it can listen, it can watch videos, etc. It can parse things really, really well. Uh, so there are very few uh, industries that I think will, sur will survive without having to change a line of code per se. If you're really sure that the machine has genuinely, uh, a machine meaning the AI, the large language model, if you're really sure it has nothing to add, fine. But I'd nearly say bookmark that because, you know, give it six weeks and something new will happen. To orient yourself properly, you have to sort of start with like what's actually possible now that wasn't possible before. And I think AI is really good at uh, reading, understanding, summarizing, generating images. And like all of this is just going to get better and better and faster and bigger and more powerful and all that sort of stuff. So you then have to sort of say, well, what, like, what's the bit that we think is the magic that like humans are, are inherently involved in? There will be something most often. You know, a, a lot of this, I really believe, our vision for the future of customer service, for example, is like is humans and AI. But they'll, like you know, the roles have changed substantially. I'd encourage you to observe a sort of hierarchy of like how far we can go with AI, and don't be shy about uh, about your ambition in a sense. The first basic level is like what I would call sort of task level. Like take an atomic little step and use AI to do it properly. So like say analyzing the sentiment of a message. You that's a it's a pretty discrete step. It's also like low downside if we get it, you know, it's it doesn't really uh, break things if we get it slightly wrong, but as you get further up the hierarchy what you'll see is there's um there's like say uh, sequences or like you know a, a chain of events which might be like uh, detect the sentiment and if it's angry move it to the angry pile and prioritize it and ping a Slack channel uh, to make sure that somebody knows, right? So you're, you're joining the dots a bit, right? A step up again above that would be what I'd call like workflow level uh, AI, right? Just you're like looking at someone's actual full workflow and saying, how can we do this? And Finn is a good example of this, right? The job is message comes in, understand the message, find the answer, look up the you know, knowledge base, look at previous conversations, jump back in, use all of that to construct an answer, send the answer, see what the customer has to say. If the customer is happy, close the conversation. If they're not, keep going, right? 
but you're automating an entire chunk of workflow. But you can go further. You can do like exception handling too. You can say things like, hey, not only do we workflows, uh, the pre you know, on the previous level, you might have like spot out exceptions, be like, don't know what to do. You can go further and say, let's start to like work through these exceptions and make sure that we have like, uh, you know, defenses against them as well. And all of a sudden then you don't, you don't even need to defer to human. You can start like dealing with your own exceptions, but then you can go all the way up to like outcome level is probably the, the highest ambition here. And out outcome level AI would be like, you simply say, I want, I want like great support or I want brilliant marketing. And you just click the kind of like big stupid go button, right? And see what happens. And I think uh, I worry a lot of folks stop their exp explorations quite low down. And I think uh, you're better off assuming that you're going to have to get to the top and work out where do you think you can start. So I think the most common criticism or the thing that people like latch onto a lot is like, can't really think like, and you've heard all sorts of like, oh, frankly, like ill-informed, it's just a bad photocopy of the internet or it's just glorified text completion or whatever. That's the most common, you know, uh, food you might hear about AI. Uh, Fergal, our, our VP of AI, he, he like, you know, I think he thoroughly debunked this in one of, in a post he wrote where he said, like, here's a scenario I've given to ChatGPT. And it's a pretty weird scenario. And the reason it's pretty weird is because in, it needs to be obvious to everyone that this story never existed before. Uh, it's, so there's no, there's no simple autocomplete that could happen. And the story was something like, I put a load of apples into a bucket with a load of super glue, and I put it on top of a door, and I called my brother into the room. Uh, my brother came in running in alarmed. What happened next? And basically, without really much of a flaw, GPT nails the answer perfectly. And then just to push the boat further and further, you can ask follow-on questions, uh, which he did. One of which was, um, we tried the exact same thing the following day with my other brother, and it didn't work. Uh, why, why might this be? And it's like, well, it could be a load of different reasons. But like, number one is probably the glue had dried. But number two, which I thought was brilliant, was like, maybe the other brother had already informed, uh, one of your brothers had informed the other brother, which is also a plausible situation. And then like, I think the third one was like, and what if we went to the moon with this bucket and tried to play the trick there? You want it? And it's like, oh, well, you're into the problems with gravity or whatever. And like, it's pretty hard to say that that's not like reasoning, that it's not like, you know, creating a sort of worldview and answering questions on it. So I think, uh, I think people have to, you know, whatever food they want to share about AI and what it can't do or how it can't think, they have to acknowledge that story in their, in their criticism and understand, like, come up with an, a, a better angle of attack that says it can't do basic thinking because it looks like it can. I remember using, I think it was rewind.ai, which is just like um, effectively a desktop memory augmentation tool. It's really cool. But um, I was trying to get it to, dis to turn off a pop-up uh, that, that comes up every time you join a new Google Meet. It would ask you, hey, do you want to record this or something like that? And I went to like their help center, couldn't get the answer anywhere. And I asked Finn, like, you know, I said, hey, I'm trying to disable this thing. It gave me a perfect answer. And then it said to me where I read the answer. And I clicked through to sort of see what the help uh, center article was. And it actually didn't include the answer. It's just, Finn just reasoned about the fact that if this is a setting about all of your various different types of recording, it's probably going to be in there, you know, which is actually uh, like, it's actually probably how a human would think about it in that like, look, what Finn was basically saying to me was, I'm pretty sure if you can do that, it's in this big bucket of settings that I've found out about over here. And so it gives you like a pretty good answer. And it turns out that was like spot on. But again, like that's, you know, I, I dare say like a, a support, person would have done roughly the same uh, unless they happen to know for a fact in which case they would have given me a firm declarative answer but oftentimes they're also going to say I don't know it's probably a notification settings <laughs> you know that's again it's not quite like sticky apple book level um, thinking but like it's the sort of thinking that you want to see in an agent to really make sure that it can uh, it can like solve a lot of these common problems because you won't get um, like a lot of the so chatbots have gone through like eras um I think it was Owen made this point recently. He's like, dude, era one of chatbots was the old IVR phone tree. Like, you know, if you want sales, press the first button. If you want support, press the second button. And that was like the gen one of chatbots. And we all thought that was amazing. But this was like the early 2000s or like 2005, 6, 7. Uh, and it really wasn't. It was a shit experience. And it was also a nightmare to set up and program. So it just wasn't really great at all. The gen two was like, we had a product in the space called Resolution Bot. And, uh, Gen 2 was using a little bit of like fuzzy AI. So it was like, type your thing and we're gonna try and roughly work out some keywords. And like, so if you say, hey, I'd like to upgrade your enterprise platinum premium sales plan, 
it would be like, hmm, that sounds like a sales query. Let's kick off the sales default response. So it's a lot of if this, then that, but the if this was powered by a sniff of AI. The biggest tax with those types of products is you had to do a load of setup work, right? And it didn't work in, in like specific instances unless you did all the work of setting up every single answer. This is where you need the sort of generative AI. That's like the gen tree, the, you know, this is like what rough fin is. Like it's a generative AI powered by large uh, language models. It is an AI agent that does all this. But it, what makes it so powerful is the way you turn fin on is not by setting up a load of if this and that rules. It's not by teaching a, the dictionary of like certain trigger words or anything like that at all. You click the on button and fins will consume all the content you give it, read all the conversations you've had before, and it'll create a sort of an understanding uh, and it'll answer questions from that understanding and it'll do it pretty damn well. I think the thing a lot of people don't get is how much uh, more uh, satisfactory it is for a user to get an instant reply to anything. You know, if I, if I said to you, hey, ask me the question you want to get solved, and you're like, oh, I'm checking in tomorrow and I'm wondering, can I get an early check-in and I have a late flight and I'm wondering blah, 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 blah. I, if I said to you, like, hey, there's, there's two options here, you can get an answer to your question immediately, or if you wait just 14 minutes, I will get you a human to write you an answer to that question. Uh, a lot of people, for a lot of questions, will say, I'll take immediately, please. And also, if I said to you, hey, the immediate answer is going to be based on all the available information that has, is there to consume, so, uh, and it'll be based on all the recent answers that the, the, you know, the team have given of late to questions like this. So what we're going to see a lot of is that Finn will deliver the best available answer immediately. And that will, in a large number of cases, be the best outcome for the customer too. There are, are all sorts of tools that are like maybe power user tools if you're to be complimentary, or maybe just damn hard to use tools if we're to be honest. And um, so I'll give you like two different examples. I would argue like Microsoft Excel is a brilliant product for people who know Microsoft Excel. And, uh, and it's nowhere near as powerful for us. Uh, let's just say enterprise SaaS software, I'll pick on one, like say Workday. That is just you know, very powerful, but also complex software that's hard to use. And in both cases, I think the ability to just speak to uh, uh, effectively an, an agent or an AI chatbot um, and say the thing you're trying to do can really like open the doors to all sorts of people or all sorts of streamlined workflows. So in Workday, it's entirely possible that in a future release, I'll just click on the little bot person's face and say, like, please book October 14th off return. And it'll say, done. And that's it. And that's all I really wanted to do. I wasn't interested in exploring their, like, you know, their beautiful taxonomy or navigation. I don't care about any of that. I just need to book the day off. But you've now blown open the total available market for these products. So, like, that's a huge sort of technological change that we're going to see play out over and over again, specifically in power user tools, because it'll blow up the addressable market. But also, I think in larger, like more complicated beasts, let's say software, like say Salesforce or Workday or things like that, Coupa, you'll, you're going to see like most of this software is not designed for the end user. It's designed for the admin or the back end or the bookkeeper or whoever. Uh, but there's a lot of people who have to log in and deal with this clunky UI. And if we could expose to them a very simple streamlined chatbot interface where they can just say the thing that they want, that's going to be like revolutionary in terms of like making it a far more like a stomachable pro product for a lot of its like you know daily active users. So I think like the idea of being good at spreadsheets hopefully will become not a thing because actually the spreadsheets are good at you, and that's the difference. The most extreme version of this is like adapt or die. Uh, a probably more radio friendly version is that we should consider it a time of massive opportunity when, when the single greatest technologist, Steve Jobs, spoke about this being like one day possible, hopefully in our lifetime. Granted, we missed his lifetime, but this is that day. You know, the one day he spoke about this is day one, and I think if you don't see the insane opportunity if you don't see the uh, the urgency on you the imperative for you to reconsider how your product uh, how your business works based on what has changed in technology over the past couple of years uh, you're missing out and i think you there's a real danger you'll find yourself running around 
shouting at the clouds, perfectly prepared for a world that we've all moved on from. And I just encourage people to get going. Like We need to rebuild our industries, our companies, our societies around this new world, and it's day one. <laughs>